Um, please welcome Sam to the stage. Uh, so this talk is kind of interesting and weird and I hope you find it interesting, but I don't necessarily recommend you do what it is doing. So take that in mind as you watch. Um, so, okay, so this is an idea I had a couple of years ago that I sort of finally got around to finishing partially because Craig was like, we need some speakers. Um, so first things first, I've written a weird bundle of things and I'm going to explain how it works. But the basic idea is that we ship a client some code and we reuse that code rather than shipping brand new code. Makes a lot of sense when you say it out loud. For a real world site, and I had to troll through terrible, terrible ancient sites that already ship three megs of JavaScript for some reason. Um, when I bump the, the version of React, we find that on a small phone, I had an old Pixel 3 lying around. Um, it's a largely really, you know, it's a huge uh, smaller download size and it starts faster, which is remarkably hard to measure, I will get to. Um, but the Pixel 3 was the oldest phone I had. And so I could show like a really notable measurable performance impro improvement on fetching this content. We're done. No, wait, there's more. Um, so firstly, there's a lot of graphs. So I apologize for that. Um, if you are curious, this is from the episode where Homer puts a crayon in his nose and Lisa's talking about how happy it makes him. Or rather, I think he has it in his nose and he puts it back. Um, so background of JavaScript, right? We write web pages. Um, we write, actually, I'm going to start a timer before I forget that I talk for too long. Um, we write a lot of JavaScript. We use a lot of libraries. We typically don't ship all those files to the client. Um, some people think we should because of the advent of HTTP2 and things like that. Um, those people are wrong. Um, but the solution is largely bundlers, right? We put our code through a rollup or Vite or ESBuild or whatever, and we ship a big file or a couple of files down. Um, this looks something like this, right? Webpack is the classic bundler that has been around for yonks. It's not very good, don't use it. Um, what happens is it takes all the bundles and put it to, it's, it puts it into one big file, which gets sent to the client. The classic problem with this is I change one of the files, I change a typo, and suddenly that one meg, five megs of JavaScript you sent to your client, ba bow, it's all invalid, right? I need a brand new file. And so, you know, I get a brand new bundle for, um, you know, I spelled a, some statement wrong and I want my code to be neat and pretty. And so your clients, your users using your site end up paying for that. And, you know, is one make of JavaScript a lot these days? Who knows? My old job, you know, when I was at Google and I used to be there, was focused a lot on third world markets and we looked at really crappy phones and, you know, one meg is a lot of JavaScript. So... When you build your code, it looks a bit like this, right? And you know, this is a bit more practical. One way that people do solve this bundling problem, and I want to give some, you know, this is what people largely do, is they put it into groups. And so what we do now, this is the state of the art. We may often define these ourselves. We may often have a tool do this for us. I know that Vite or Vite, however you want to pronounce it, um, automatically creates bundles based on different sizes of how much stuff it has. But classic tools, you can say, well, I'm going to put React, which is a fairly stable dependency, into its own chunk. And what ends up happening here is you ship a, a main file and a React file. And if you bump your main file, you change something in that, to be fair, this works pretty well, right? Only the main file changes and the React file that the user already has, they've already fetched React for your site, it doesn't change. The problem with this though, is soon, as soon as I bump React, as soon as I change that, everything above that has to change as well. And we see this quite literally in code, right? If you look at the built code of some site, you'll see that your entry point in JavaScript will reference another file. And this, if you haven't seen this syntax before with the kind of random letters at the end, we use this basically to say, this is a, a, um, a, a cache header or a cache busting thing, right? So you ship a file, it's got a random string at the end that basically tells your web server or whatever that this file can be sent to your clients and they can hold it forever. This is a good feature, right? Like if I know that this file is never going to change, it's always immutable, not having a client fetch this is really useful. And this is the reason why whenever you change something, those, those little random sets of characters need to change as well. Because otherwise that you don't know whether one file talks to the different, like you don't know what version you're at, right? So this is a pretty standard thing you see if you have a build code with Vite or Webpack or whatever. So the other bit of background we need before we talk about what I've built is that your code fundamentally has two types. And they're either, it's either code that has no side effects, and I'll get to what that means in a second, or kind of what you think of as your main code. And if you've ever written like non-web languages, you always have a main function, right? And so JavaScript, even though we kind of often hide it away, in the end, like you have a React DOM dot render call, or you have a whatever it is that actually puts stuff onto your page. Um, I'll use blue and red to represent these in the talk. And so blue is the no side effects code, and red is the main code. Now, what's really interesting is that like this function here, which generates Fibonacci numbers, you can imagine this is a function that has no side effects, right? I call it and it generates a Fibonacci number. It really, you know, it, it doesn't affect my page whatsoever. It's purely stateless, side effect free, whatever you want to call it. But what I want to point out is that actually when we write code, 
This function also has no, no side effects. And the reason it doesn't is because I'm not actually calling it. And so even though the function does something, it actually has no side effects by it, it existing, right? For me, this looks like this right now, right? I've never, I don't use this function, so it might as well say blah in the middle, right? There's nothing going on here, but I know that I've declared a function that I can use later. But the declaration itself doesn't do anything. Um, notably, main code, it might be when I actually call that function. So when I call that append and create DOM method, yes, that is obviously a thing that I'm doing that's part of my imperative main chunk of my program. So this tool I've written, which I've given a name, what does it do? So it's a tool that does interesting things with, things with ES modules. Um, it's an approach is basically to flip the bundling problem on its head. So we bundle everything together. We don't create small chunks. And then we pull out the things that are reusable and save them for later. That corpus, that, site, that, that bundle of second stuff has no side effects by definition. We then reuse that corpus on every new build. So if we know that your client already fetched that file, we can kind of poke into it and say, well, we know that Joe has already fetched that old version of that, content, that, that method or that complicated thing. We're going to reuse it rather than sending it down to them anew. Yes, it's very confusing. Like I said, this may or may not be something you actually want to use, but you can play with it. So what we basically do is we've got this build. As I said before, we bundle everything together. We've got our main code. We've got our no side effects code. Kudo, the tool, pulls them apart. So OK, I've got my main, my main code. I've got my side effects code. This is two fetches. We then change something. We rebuild our code. And so what we see is that obviously some of the main code has changed and some of the functions and classes or whatever you think of as no side effects have also changed. We keep the version A file around. We actually don't use part of it anymore. And we then create a new file which just represents the changed bits of this code. This is a bit confusing, right? So we, create, we end up with you know, not just one file, but, but three files. Is that what we want? And the answer is kind of yes. Um, What's really interesting here is that the old client that fetched the big version of A on the left here has a bit of code that's no longer used. It's dead. It'll never use it ever again. But it can cache that file forever because it's going to use the bits of that that are still relevant. It then has a version of B, which has just the change bits. And a brand new client, which you see on the right, never saw the larger version of A. It just sees the now reduced version of A. So it's fetching always the minimal amount of code required to render your site. Um, Let's give a kind of more practical example. So we do a couple of builds, and each time we do a build, we generate a new one of these kind of bundles. I've come in at build two. So I, you know, ship my site. User comes along the next day saying, yeah, I'm going to load the content and have a look at it. You fetch A and B. That's what you need to load the site. Tomorrow, you come back. You've already got A and B. Even if A and B is now being used less than it was before, there's some bits that are no longer relevant, I only fetch the minimal amount I need to actually run the site, plus the little bit of main code on top that always has to change. And similarly, I come back the next day again, and I'm fetching very little code because I've already got those bits. Um, they've already been pulled out of that library. Sounds great. Sounds interesting. People are a bit confused, but you know, it's a thing you can do. Um, how does it work? Well, it needs ESM versus CJS. If you don't know what this is, you're either using import or require in your code. Um, CJS, in case people are curious, was an invention of Node back when modules weren't really a thing. Um, ESM is more of a standard. It's got its problems. People are grumpy about it. It's got weird things with default. But it is a standard that lets us do interesting things with its format. Um, it's also got this usual cap. This tool has the usual caveats, right? Don't run a val. Like, just don't run a val anywhere. Every bundler in the world is like, if you run a val, the universe will explode. Please don't do it. Um, one interesting thing about ESM that I really like that often people think of as a bug is ESM supports circular references. So this example is not very good, right? But I'm basically saying, like, I've got file A and file B, and I can reference each other, each those files uh, from within each other. And annoyingly, Tools like ESLint will just say, no, this is wrong. Don't do this. But actually, it's really powerful for a bunch of reasons. Um, what it really is is an extension of the JavaScript concept called hoisting. Now, who knows who's what knows what hoisting is? Vaguely, yeah, okay, we've hoisted our hands up in the in the sky. Um, so it basically means I can use this function before it before it actually is declared. That's pretty handy, right? Um, how does that work? Well, the Browser basically says, I don't care where you write function. I'm going to treat it as if, it's, as, if it's, as if it is at the top. It's also this weird thing called temporal dead zone, which I'll skip for now. Um, it's very interesting, but maybe not relevant as I've thought about it more. The tool works basically by hoisting everything it can as much as it can. So we're going to have a little bit of Q&A for fun. So I demonstrated how functions hoist. Do, do variables hoist? Does this work? Who thinks it's going to work? Yeah, no, no, it doesn't work, turns out. Because it's a variable, right? And it doesn't have the same behavior as functions do. Now, this one's interesting. People think classes hoists, because I've written the class like a function, right? I haven't written const blah. I've written class, hello class. Who thinks this is going to hoist? 
I've got a couple of hands. No, you're wrong, sorry. Um, classes have side effects. Their definition might have side effects. And the reason it happens is because of a couple of reasons. One is the superclass here is just an expression. You can put what you like here. You can put one here. It won't work, but it can have side effects. Um, you can have static properties on classes, which reading top to bottom will run where they're written. And similarly, you even have static blocks, which are not a well-used feature, but they're like a iffy that happens right in the class context. Um, we just are, we are at functional components anyway, right? Who cares? Um, I can go back to that joke if you need to get need a second to read it. Um, but you know, we don't use classes anymore, right? Um, so why do functions hoist? I've kind of mentioned why this happens, but they have no side effects, right? They can be anywhere. But the most complicated thing you have is a, a, a parameter that has a default value, in which case this is it happens when it when it's run. We now, in what I've done, is I've extended this notion of hoisting. So I've said you can't do this, but actually the reality is you can. These three things on the right here can be wherever they like and the code's still going to work because they don't relate to each other. Let's learn some more. Um, we can have real side effects, like I'm creating a class here, but I'm just going to put this in a function. And so now my program at the bottom can use that, that thing like it was hoisted, right? I've, I've just moved that functionality somewhere else. And that top declaration of the dollar sign one is, has the same thing. It has no side effects. So I can put that wherever I like. And yes, it works for classes as well, which is complicated. I'm not going to explain this slide. Um, what I'm going to say though is um, what I've done is with this class is we can pull out its pieces. And if you're really keen, and I probably don't have time to explain everything here, but if you're really, really keen of what's going on, you can understand that actually this is kind of broken, right? Because I'm referencing weird things in different ways. And the way that the tool fundamentally works is that the red bit's my imperative code. I can get my class on the left here. I can pass it out down and say, I'm going to create my class. Great. But my other static bit of code needs to know about that that I just declared. So how does that work? Well, I can hoist and import that back into my blue file and then use it again in the same main file. And oh, it's very confusing, but this is the kind of value that the um, circular references and um, the way ESM works enables this tool to actually function. Now, you know, I could spend here for days explaining this, but trust me, it works. It re really does make a lot of sense. And this property makes this tool actually work. So I want to sort of wrap up a little bit and I have, have a minute. I might give a quick little bit of a demo to see, just to show you what it actually looks like. Um, Fundamentally, this tool I've written lets you split any file into its imperative parts and to its, and to its no side effects parts. It does this by interesting creative use of these tools. Um, and the main benefit is, like I said, it automatically leverages what your clients already have. You don't have to worry about defining packages or bundles in your bundler. You just say, well, hey tool, go and um, match what I've already sent to the user and find me the bits that I'm, I can reuse. Hilariously, actually, one thing that I didn't even mention in the slide, what, I, what the tool actually does is if, it, if you have two functions that are exactly the same, I only ship you one of them because it kind of just happens for free. I go, oh, cool, I have a function that looks like that. I'll just use that one already. So it's not that common that your code has the same function several times, but this tool actually just finds them and, and nukes them, right? Because there's no relevance for the, the DB2. Um, notably also, this also works really well because Chrome and other browsers don't just cache the JavaScript file um, but they also uh, cache the compiled version. So you actually get a double whammy benefit of not shipping JavaScript. But if you've listened to all my all the famous JavaScript YouTubers about, oh, the cost of JavaScript and blah, 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 what they're really talking about is half the parsing cost. And so by the time you parse it and run it, you actually get the benefit that you're reusing that code that's already been shipped to a client. Why shouldn't you use this? It's honestly a bit weird. And if I'm the person, first person who's done it, like, I'm not that smart. Like, maybe someone else has thought of this problem and is discarded it already. Um, you need to keep the previous artifacts around. Um, what we're doing is we're seeing what we've already sent to the client. And to, yeah, of course, it, like the file's on your website. You can just go and fetch it. But you imagine a lot of build systems are not really geared towards, like, I'm going to cache the output of my build system so I can look at it again the next time. That is a thing you need to do because you need to know what I've sent to people in the past. And a lot of tools are kind of like stateless where like you build the same thing, you'll actually get the same hashes, but you never really want to keep the files around because it's kind of annoying. So this is a reason not to use it. Um, it's also not a bundler, right? Like it really works on it as a kind of post build step for some of these tools. Having said that, this is not something you should use as part of your build process. It's purely something you should use if for some reason you think that like having if you think that the, the cost of your JavaScript being sent to your clients is too high, and then it's really only something that happens like right at the end of your build process. So it's like less awkward to shove in because you're not trying to like awkwardly make it work with your you know, refresh, reload cycle and things like that. It's really something that happens right at the end. Um, and also maybe your JavaScript is just not that big, but if it is, then you should feel bad. Um, 
that's the end of the talk. Um, I have a couple of things I would put after the end of the talk just to remind myself to mention them. Um, if you want to have a look, you can go to the kudo.dev and have a look. I just made a domain name and you know looked at GitHub. If you have a big project, you could run it on it and tell me how it works. Because I found it really hard to find big projects like that have a lot of JavaScript. Turns out when I used to have a real job and I worked for people, their code was horrible and that was also my fault. But I don't have that code anymore because I don't work there anymore. So I can't really shame them, if that makes sense. Um, so if you, have a big, 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 if you have a big bundle for some reason and you're like, oh, if only I could make this smaller, then come have a look at this tool. Um, this is less, this is more esoteric. I might skip this for now. Um, part of the reason I wrote this tool is I wrote, I wanted to look at what a bundle does and bundles have side effects and no side effects. And it's interesting because a lot of bundlers will mark things like creating a new map as pure. And if you see this pure annotation in your code, sometimes a bundler has said, this has no side effects, but I'm a purist, right? So what if I rename, what if I replaced map with my nefarious object? So this is a debate about whether some things have side effects or not. And that's something that's kind of orthogonal to the talk, but I thought I'd mention it as an interesting discussion. Like does json.parse has no side effects, right? It makes an object from some text, but what if you replace json? And like never, no one will ever do this, but I'm a purist, right? So um, I'm just gonna plug some other stuff. Um, as I've kind of alluded to, I have no fixed employer. I am running an engineering leadership course if you wanna learn about that. Apparently I can tell you how to be a better engineer. Um, hit me up if you're curious about that. Um, I also contract for Google occasionally and write a course on testing. So if you want to learn about testing, you should go there and have a read. It's pretty good. The, the MO for the testing course was basically, we think people write a lot of React and have no idea how to test. How do we fix that? And it's like, here's a horrible React component. We're going to test it. So if you struggle with testing React, have a look. Oh, and this is how you test Pixel 3s with terrible sites with, you know, I had to literally go to Chinese websites and like modify the node modules of Webpack because one of the plugins is wrong and I had to try, you know, you get the idea, it's so bad. So please don't use Webpack anymore. That's the talk, I appreciate your time.